Well, thank you, Phil. Thank you, music team, for blessing us with the songs this morning and preparing our hearts uh, this morning as we continue our worship of the Lord as we engage uh, the Word of God here this morning. Well, as you know, we we have much to uh, always be in prayer for and praying about. And as Phil mentioned earlier, uh, this morning we're going to pray and uh, we'll ask the Lord to bless his word to our hearts this morning. But as well, we want to be uh, lifting up the people uh, there in Texas. I'm reminded uh, of the scripture that God says uh, he works all things together for good. And uh, in the midst of all the suffering, in the midst of all the flooding and the difficulty, uh, it's been amazing the opportunities uh, that we have seen to share Christ. Uh, many of you may not know this, but the Southern Baptists have a disaster relief team that's actually larger uh, than the Red Cross. Now, that's, that's saying something, isn't it? But that's a Southern Baptist. Uh, This morning on CBS, Washington, D.C., I saw a feature story, just as I was tying my tie this morning coming to church, uh, but it was a feature story on Texas Baptist men out of Dallas, Texas. And this organization is a disaster relief team uh, that is well organized, and it showed them in a warehouse putting all the things together. Uh, This man uh, actually custom built a trailer that has four showers in it. So four people can be taking a shower at one time, and he's trailering it down there from Dallas to to Houston. Has another trailer that has four washing machines in it. And uh, it was just a blessing to see them putting the cellophane around a pallet stacked high of Bibles. The gospel of Jesus Christ is going to go forward uh, through this difficult time. If you go to our church website, we are featuring Samaritan's Purse, another enormously huge disaster relief group. And so there are opportunities for the gospel of Jesus Christ to flow in with just as much significance as did the water uh, that has risen there. And so we need to be in prayer that God would richly use this opportunity to advance his kingdom. If God gives you the opportunity, maybe you're retired, you want to go down there, there are opportunities, I'm sure, to serve. Uh, I'm I'm sure of it. Uh, Those Baptist men in Texas, uh, they were going for two months uh, to to head down there, and God bless them as as they go and do that. So pray for the advance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, pray for the people. They've gone through some terrible times and suffering, and families have had uh, experience of loss of life, and it's been traumatic uh, for certain, and we lift them up uh, as well. But we pray for God to use this to his glory. Amen? Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer together as a church family. Father in heaven, we approach you now thankful uh, for the understanding that we have that because you are sovereign, because you are all wise and over all things, Father, just as you have done so many times in the past, you're able to take that which is evil, that which is bad, that which is tragic, and turn it about and make something good of it. We pray for these who are ministering, Lord, in Texas. We pray for the teams that are there on the ground showing forth the love of Christ. And may the world see the testimony of the saints there as they roll up their sleeves and they help these who are in need. May they not only experience the love of Christ in such a way, but may they also experience the love of Christ in the form of the gospel of Jesus Christ that is all-powerful and able to transform lives. So Lord, we just would lift up these who are suffering, these who have gone through a very difficult time and are continuing to go through this difficult time. May you show your mercy and grace uh, through the hands of the believers and the hands of the others that are there ministering as well, that uh, this might be an opportunity, Father, we pray. For the, for the true gospel of Jesus Christ to go forward there. So Lord, we just lift them up in prayer this morning. Bless the word of God as well, Lord, as we open your word today. May it speak to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' wonderful name, amen. You may be seated. Well, it's good to be back with you. We were gone the last two Sundays. Uh, I talked to some people this morning who said, yeah, I've been gone the last two Sundays, so you didn't even know I was gone. Um, But uh, the first Sunday uh, that we were away, we were in Myrtle Beach taking care of our grandkids. And uh, that's not vacation, let me just say. That is not vacation. Uh, One's two plus and one's one plus. 
And uh, yeah, so uh, you, you know how it is when you babysit like little kids for a couple hours and you say, wow, this is babysitting them for a whole week. And they're a lot of fun and they're real joyful. And uh, it, it's really a, a blessing that we're able to do that. And then we went to Florida. We went to Florida for a week and uh, had a wonderful time with our friends. But while we were down there, it rained 20 inches in southwest Florida in Cape Coral. I'm not making it up. They canceled school. I, I was looking out the, the last Sunday. I looked out the window and I said, the water's coming up on the tire of the truck in the driveway. And sure enough, that whole thing was flooded. There was somebody out there in an eight foot high inflatable floating down the street. And I thought, mercy me, you know, this is ridiculous. Um, but uh, the Lord blessed us anyway. It was a good restful time. And, and it's good to be back with you here. And I am excited this morning because we're dealing with uh, the last segment of the attributes of God. And this morning we're going to be talking about the glory of God. And uh, when you try to define the glory of God, that's not an easy task. But what we're going to do is we're going to, to, to pull apart uh, some passages of Scripture that really show forth what God has done with his glory and how it impacts our life. I've preached through many, many series over the years. And I would have to tell you that the series that I'm concluding today has been one of the most impactful series in my personal life. Uh, as uh, having the opportunity to study uh, who God is uh, has caused me to stop and really think about the Lord. And now I've told you before, I am not the kind of person who tends to overthink things. I like to keep things as, as simple as I can. But as I got thinking about the glory of God, I started thinking what it was, must be like in heaven with God. I know you're sitting there going, don't start thinking that because it's too deep. And, and you're starting to think, and I'm thinking to myself, what was it like before God created the angels, before God created man? I mean, there is God. He's in heaven, and uh, his glory is, is shining round about. And, and, and think of this as my Sunday school teacher taught me. God has no beginning and no end. And they told me he's like a circle. Have you ever stopped to think about time in such a way? It hurts your head. Don't try it. You can't figure it out. I'm thankful for the words of Zophar in the book of Job, Job chapter 11. Can you discover the depths of God? What's the answer? No. Can you discover the limits of the Almighty? No. Uh, they are as high as the heavens. What can you do? Uh, deeper than Sheol, the place of the dead, the realm of the dead. What can you know? Its message is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. That is also true, and it helps me to sleep at night knowing that I cannot figure out all of the depths of who God is. But Spurgeon said this, and I shared this, I believe, the first week when we started this series. Nothing will so enlarge the intellect, nothing so magnify the whole soul of man as a devout, earnest, continued investigation of the great subject of the deity. The most excellent study for expanding the soul is the science of Christ and him crucified and the knowledge of the Godhead in the glorious Trinity. And so we've studied the attributes of God. We've looked at the holiness of God. We've even looked at the wrath of God and, yes, the goodness of God, the love of God, the unchangeableness of God, all of these attributes that make God God. Well, the scripture is very clear. If you go back through the scriptures, you find in Psalm chapter 19 that the heavens declare the glory of God. Isaiah 43, the beast of the field shall give me glory. Colossians 1.16 says, all things were made by him and for him. In Isaiah 48, verse 11, God's not going to give up his glory. He says, my glory I will not give to another. The glory of God is something of great, great significance. And what we see in the scriptures is clear. The creation has bowed itself to the Almighty and desires to give honor and glory to him. But the highest of the creation, that is the angels, that is mankind, has failed to glorify God. Think about it. 
God creates the angels, it was the angels who rebelled. Remember Lucifer, he thought to himself, I am going to exalt my position higher than the throne of Almighty God. And he was kicked out of heaven because of that. The angels fall, we have now the demonic realm, those who are working against Almighty God. Mankind has the opportunity as well to bring glory to God. But Romans chapter one would tell us there uh, that man has refused to do that. Romans chapter one, let me just read for you a couple of verses here. Because God says that even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. They would not give God the glory. When they knew God, even though they knew God, they would not honor him, or that word means to glorify him. They refused to give God glory. This is the problem with sinful man and man's sinful heart. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You see, the glory of God is the highest standard you can have. It is the sum of all of his attributes. And man in his sinful condition falls short of the glory of God. Man, even though they knew God, the Bible says, and how did they know God? Romans chapter 1, they knew him because of the creation and because of the heavens. They knew that there is a higher power. They, they, they may not know through that alone that Jesus is the Savior, but they know that there is a God. And they refuse to bring him glory. All throughout history, God has wanted man to be in a relationship with him. And he has wanted to have his presence felt in the lives of human beings. God comes to us with a desire to fellowship with us. In the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve are created and the Bible says that in the cool of the evening, the presence of God would come and walk among Adam and Eve. You see, God wants to embrace the created man. And this is something that he's wanted to do from the start. He created us to have a relationship with us. He holds his arms out for us and Ultimately, sin gets in the way. <laughs> Take your Bibles and go with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, we have a picture of God fellowshipping with Adam and Eve. And we know that if we start in verse 1, we have the fall of man. We have the fall of man. Uh, Satan comes, the serpent's more, more crafty, and they decide to eat of the forbidden fruit. You pick this up here in verse eight. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden, in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And God calls out to them and says, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. And God says, who told you that you were naked? The presence of God. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking. And they hid themselves, the Bible says, from the presence of God. How many have ever heard the term Shekinah glory? You've heard the word Shekinah. Many of you have. The word in the Hebrew means literally to dwell. It's the idea that the glory of God dwells among mankind. And so when they heard his footsteps in the garden, they could hear his presence there. And the Bible says clearly the presence of God was there in the garden. God creates Adam and Eve and his desire is to have fellowship with them. He has embraced them. At this point in time, they hadn't sinned before chapter three, and so the relationship was very positive and was very good. In chapter three, they fall into sin, and it changes the relationship that God has with his created human beings, Adam and Eve. 
Ultimately, what has happened in the garden has been on the part of Adam and Eve to reject the presence of God. They are rejecting the glory of God, the very Shekinah glory, the dwelling glory of God they are saying no to. They would rather have taken the forbidden fruit so that their eyes would somehow be opened. So when God says to them, who told you that you were naked, God knew already what had happened, didn't he? The people there in the garden had chosen not to glorify God. The glorification was there. God was coming. His glory was seen. I believe it's best to understand. And we might have images in our mind of God walking with Adam and Eve. But we have to remember this. God is a spirit and we worship him in spirit and truth. That's right. And so there in the garden, it's most likely that this was presented to Adam and Eve with God in the garden as represented by light. His light was there in the garden, and it would come, and he would, through that manifestation, fellowship with them. So that when they decided they would not glorify him, his presence left the garden, they were removed from the garden, and angels were guarding the entrance to the garden. So the fellowship was broken. What I like about the scriptures as you look through it, God is so long-suffering, isn't he? He is so merciful, and he really wants this relationship with us. And so he tries again. And, and we see him try again after Adam and Eve reject it. You have Israel, and uh, through Moses, we have this amazing experience. Take your Bibles and go with me here to Exodus and chapter 33. In Exodus chapter 33, this is a time uh, when there's been some spiritual darkness in Israel, quite frankly. In chapter 32, we have the time where the golden calf is made and so forth. And so it's interesting, but God comes to Moses in chapter 33 and verse 12, and Moses He tells him, I want you to bring up this people. See, you say to me, bring up this people. And so Moses says, but you yourself have not let me know who you will send with me. In other words, God, I understand you want me to go and do this, but you're asking me to do this by myself? I can't do this by myself. And so Moses comes and he pleads before God, and God tells him ultimately that uh, I'm going to go with you. He says to him in verse 14, and he said, my presence shall go with you, and I'll give you rest. Well, Moses takes that, and he hears what God has to say. Now, when he says the presence of God will go with him, he's speaking here about the glory of God going with with Moses. Moses turns to God and says to him later in that same chapter, verse 18, Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. Show me your presence. You have said you will go with me and you will help me lead these people, but show me your very presence. And God tells him, he says, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Here's the problem. You and I, and any human being, Moses included, cannot see the very glory of God in its full strength, or God says, you'll be incinerated, Moses. Moses is like, I want to see it. God says, wait a minute, you can't see it. If you want to see it, you're going to get fried. And so you don't want to see it. So what does he tell him to do? Notice here, I mean, this is the, in the cleft of the rock song, right? He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. He says to him, behold, there's a place by me, and you shall stand there on the rock, and it will come about while my glory is passing by. This I will put in the, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Moses, if you want a glimpse of the glory of God, this is what you have to do. I'm going to pass by this rock and you're going to hide there in this little hole and I'm going to put my hand over it so that you can't see me directly. And when I get past you, I'll take my hand off and you'll see a glimpse of my back parts. 
because that's all you can see. But if you ever saw my face, you would be incinerated. Well, Moses is, is just joyful over this opportunity uh, to see the glory of God. And next chapter down, chapter 34, Moses is coming down from the mountain, and the Bible says that when Moses was coming down, chapter 34, verse 29, uh, he had the tablets with him, and the Bible says Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him. And so Aaron and the, the rest all saw that, and afterward the sons of Israel came near. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with them, he would cut off the veil or take off the veil until he came out. Whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel, what he had been commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. So Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak uh, with him. So we see this shining on the part of Moses. Moses didn't even realize it. He comes down from the mountain and his face is just a glow from experiencing the glory of God. Now, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Well, he wears this veil, and it's difficult to say exactly. We'll, we'll get into this more as we start our study in October with 2 Corinthians, uh, chapter 3 specifically. But here in this passage, he puts this veil over his face. Many think he put the veil over because of the fact that the people were very unholy. Remember the golden calf that had taken place in chapter 33. And Moses was veiling the glory because the people were afraid when they saw Moses' face face. The point is this, God was demonstrating to the people of Israel that his presence was coming back. Right after this chapter, we're introduced to the tabernacle, and that God is telling the people of Israel, this is how I want you to build the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle was going to be pretty special. Take your Bibles and go with me over to uh, Exodus here and, and look at the last chapter of Exodus, chapter 40. In chapter 40, we, fi we find that the glory of the Lord has settled there in the tabernacle. Chapter 40 and verse 34, the Bible says this, that the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses wasn't able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Remember, before, there was a pillar outside, and Moses could go into the tent of meeting. And the people would all take notice when Moses was going in, and they would stop what they were doing, and they would worship and uh, pray for Moses, and he would go in. Now Moses can't do that. Why? Because the tent of meeting is now the tabernacle, and the glory of God resides there. Pretty exciting. You see, God, again, he has his arms open wide, and he wants to have fellowship with mankind. Now, it worked really well when you had Adam and Eve, and you had no sin. But now, we have to do something to deal with the sin. And that something, because the tabernacle, there would be the sacrificial system, and there would be sacrifices that were made as to cover the sin, so that the glory of God, the presence of God, would dwell there, and sinful mankind would be able to have a relationship with the Almighty. Pretty cool, isn't it? Everything goes along well until you get to Numbers. Numbers uh, chapter 13. And you have the spies and you have the report and all of those things and they failed to believe. Now at this point in time, you still have the glory of God apparent. The presence of God is there. And God wants, because of the wickedness of the people, to destroy them, but he does not. He allows the generation to die in the wilderness and he takes the new generation into the promised land. After they're in the promised land, there's a lot of things that happen. The land's all divided up, as you recall, and people want to have kings. So the first king is, is King Saul. Second king is King David. King David was excited about the opportunity to build the temple of God. He wants to build the temple of God because he's excited about the presence of God. You see, God was promising, if you build this temple this way, my presence will come back. And so it was Solomon who ultimately builds the temple and the presence of God comes back. 
Again, you have the sacrificial system, which is allowing sinful human beings like you and me to have a relationship with a holy God. But it is because God desires us to come into this relationship with him. And it's all going along very well until you come to Ezekiel. Look up Ezekiel chapter 8 with me, would you? Ezekiel, the 8th chapter. Ezekiel is going to receive a, a vision from the Lord. He receives this vision from the Lord, and it's a sad vision. The temple had been occupied by God, the Shekinah glory, to dwell. He is dwelling there with them. And in chapter 8, Ezekiel has a vision from God, and it says, Behold, verse 4, the glory of the God of Israel was there like the appearance which I saw in the plain. And so Ezekiel, in his vision, sees the glory of God. The glory of God is something that's real. It's, it's a real thing. And God takes Ezekiel and shows him the heart condition of the people. The Bible says just a couple verses later, Son of man, do you see what they're doing? The great abominations which the house of Israel are committing here so that I would be, uh, I would be far from my sanctuary. Uh, but yet you will see still greater abominations. And he describes these abominations. It's terrible. Uh, he looks into the temple and on the temple walls inside, uh, there are drawings of these false deities, these false gods. In his vision, he sees the women weeping over the false god Tammuz. Uh, and this is just a, a hideous, hideous time. Remember, up until this time, the glory of God has been dwelling there in the temple. Because God wants to have a relationship with us. But notice in chapter 10 and verse 18. The glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. Incrementally in chapter 10, the glory of God departs from the temple. They will continue to go on and do all the things that they're doing, never even realizing that the glory of God has departed. By the time you come to the New Testament time, we still have a temple, we still have the operation of the temple taking place, but we have people whose hearts are far away from the one true God, with the exceptions of a few people. You see what's happening? God wants to have a relationship with sinful human beings, but we keep rejecting, we keep rejecting over and over again the glory of God. Go with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. We're finally in the New Testament. As we look here in the New Testament, we see in the person of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the glory of God come to earth. And the Bible says, and the word became flesh, verse 14, and dwelled among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father full of grace and truth. It is an amazing testament that God ultimately sends Jesus Christ, the Messiah, to this earth. And he is the living demonstration of the glory of God. And what does man do with Jesus Christ? They ultimately reject him. They ultimately put him on the cross, crucify him, hoping that he would be forever out of their lives. They want nothing to do with the glory of God that is in the person of Jesus Christ, and so they are seeking to push him away. Notice with me over in Luke. Just go back one book, if you would. Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, we have the transfiguration. The Bible says that some eight days, I'm in Luke chapter 9 and verse uh, 28, some eight days after these things, uh, he took Peter, John, and James, and they went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different, and his clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, uh, two men were talking with him, that's Moses and Elijah, uh, who, appearing in glory, were speaking of his departure, which was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Now, 
the Bible says Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep, but when they were fully awake, they saw his glory. As we look at that passage in Luke chapter 9, what we're witnessing there is Peter, James, and John seeing for themselves the full, unadulterated, unveiled glory of Jesus Christ. And it is so captivating for Peter, James, and John. Uh, they looked at Jesus and they said, hey, we should build a condo, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. I mean, let's just live here. I mean, the HOA fees won't even kill you. I mean, this is going to be great. They were so excited that was like the end of the line. It was like the, the goal of goals. No wonder when you come to John chapter 17 and Jesus says to the Father, I desire, my single desire is for these who you have given me, the followers of Jesus Christ, I want them to be able to see my glory. I want them to see the full glory that you have given me. My friends, when you and I are in heaven, we will be able to see the full glory of Jesus Christ. We won't be able to see the full glory of God the Father, but it's manifest in the person of Jesus Christ. This is going to be phenomenal. This is going to excite you beyond your wildest imaginations. It is something that I can't even explain, but I read it in the scriptures, and I know it's awesome, and I can't wait to see it. This is going to be phenomenal. You think I'm kidding? I'm not. I am dead serious. Take your Bibles and go with me over to Luke, and uh, we'll look here. I'm sorry, Matthew. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 29. I want to show you here this passage of Scripture because I just think it's so cool. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is talking about the end of days, basically. And he talks about what's going to happen immediately after the tribulation. Now, the tribulation is seven years of, of judgment that God is pouring out on the world. And it leads up to the Armageddon and ultimately climaxes with Jesus' second coming. Are you with me? So Jesus' second coming is what is in view here. Immediately, the Bible says, after the tribulation of those days, the, the sun, it says, will be darkened. The sun is going to be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. You know, you know we just had a big deal about the eclipse, Right? How many of you got eclipse glasses? All right, a whole bunch of you did. Wow. Well, as it worked out, we were actually in Myrtle Beach. We were only about 15 minutes away from where there was 100% total blackout. And uh, we didn't drive down there because the boys were napping. And believe me, it's more important that the boys nap <laughs> than it is for you to see an eclipse. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? All right. Uh, so I, I wish I had a picture of my dear wife standing there with her glasses on. That would have been fun to flash this morning, but she wouldn't have made me lunch. So, <laughs> so here we are. We're ready for the eclipse. The boys are napping. I've got my beach chair and a bag of Tostitos or whatever eating in, in, the, in the driveway, and I'm excited. And we've looked up there with our glasses, and you could see the start of it. I mean, you could just see it. It was like, whoo, this is going to be cool. And Karen's really excited about this. And all of a sudden, the only big cloud around came and went. The guy across the street had a drone. He was trying to go up through the cloud, I think, and be able to see it through his drone. I mean, it was, it was potentially cool. <laughs> Somebody in the first service came to me and said, hey, I was only 15 minutes from you. I was down in Georgetown. It was not a stinking cloud in the sky. <laughs> he said it was really neat. Here's the thing. I sat there, and it got kind of dark, and then it got kind of light again, and that was the end of it. And the boys woke up, and that was really the end of it. But this is so different here in Matthew. Can you see that? The, the sun is going to be darkened. And God doesn't say how he's going to do that, but the point is this. There is no light coming from the sun. 
And the moon isn't reflective, and the moon has nothing to do with it. It's out of the equation. And if you're thinking about the stars, they're literally shooting stars, and they've fallen out of the sky. There is absolutely, absolutely, absolutely no light. And if you watched on the Weather Channel, because those guys were going hyper, uh, during that eclipse, they'd show the darkness, and, and it got really dark. That's nothing compared to how dark it's going to be at the second coming of Jesus Christ. It is going to be absolutely stone You can go like this and you will not see the hand in front of your face. And then this is what the Bible says. He says, and there, the sign of the Son of Man, pretty exciting, will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. The glory of God is going to be seen. Now, this isn't Jesus in an earthly body. Remember the, the transfiguration? What happened to Jesus when he was there? He looked different, the Bible says. He began to glow, and there was a, there was a, a glory that was attached to him. And, and when they came down off the mountain, he was back looking like you and me because he had taken on his human form. When Jesus Christ comes back, and understand this, every time God has held out his arms to mankind, man has rejected his presence. When Jesus Christ comes back at the very, very end, there is no choices to be made. He is coming back with his full glory on display. I mean, this is going to be so bright. Forget about the sun. This is the glory of the Most High, and he is coming down to earth, and in the second coming of Jesus Christ is going to be one of the great events of all time. And man will step back in awe of who he is. In fact, the Bible describes those who are not believers will step back in just utter dismay because they don't know what is actually happening. And the Bible tells us that he will bring his angels with him. And Colossians tells us that he'll bring the saints with him. You're going to be on that trip when Jesus Christ comes back and the world will see his glory. You will be a reflectant of the glory of God at that point in time, the glory of Jesus Christ. Pretty exciting, isn't it? You stop and you think about this great event, and you think about the glory of God as it's been demonstrated through the world over time. It is very true that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But this is exactly why Jesus Christ came. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is why we read in the scriptures, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, he says, do all to the glory of God. Eating and drinking, by putting that there, he is saying the mundane things of life should all be done to bring God glory. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and that you're not your own? You've been brought with a price. Therefore, he says, do what with your body? Glorify God in your body. I like the King James. What? Don't you know? <laughs> well, what is wrong with you? Don't you know that the Holy Spirit of God dwells within you? This is one of those times when you look at these attributes and you, you study the glory of God and you realize the significance, the weightedness of having the Holy Spirit dwell within us. This is of huge significance. It means that if you were a follower of Jesus Christ, every cotton-picking thing you do should be done so as to bring God glory. You see, bringing God glory is why you were created in the first place. You weren't created to have your own life. I got my own life. Baloney, you got nothing. You've got God. You've got Jesus Christ. That means everything that you and I do should be done with the intent of bringing the glory to God because he is the one who's worthy of our praise and the Holy Spirit of God now dwells within us. You are not your own. You get up on Sunday morning and say, ah, I think I'll play golf. Man, you're not your own. Ask God what you should do, amen? 
Ask God. Oh, I'm going to go to the beach. Ask God. You see, God says, everything you do should be bringing me glory. So obey my word. Follow me. There is a weightedness to this. This is so significant. It is not a haphazard thing for me to tell you that the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you. Oh, yeah, Holy Spirit, sealed the day of redemption. Yep, that's great. Mm -hmm. See up there. It's not like that. God has extended his grace to us, and all who will come and place their faith in Jesus Christ will receive the Spirit of God, and you're sealed, it's true, to the day of redemption, but your life is not your own. You exist, and I exist, for the purpose of glorifying Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. No other reason. If you're here this morning and you've yet to place your faith in Jesus Christ, this is why you were created. You were created, God has his arms out, he wants to have fellowship with you. There's no no temple anymore. There's no garden anymore. There's no tent anymore. But make no mistake about it, God has not left the world without a revelation of his glory. But the only way the world is ever going to see his glory is when you and I live to manifest that glory. You and I have a task. And our job is to bring God the glory that he alone deserves. How important is that? There's a weightedness to it, isn't there not? A seriousness to it, without question. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we just approach you with a, a soberness of heart. Knowing, Lord, that we as your children are to be light bearers. We're to reflect the glory of our God. While we live, may we demonstrate holiness. May we demonstrate justness. May we demonstrate righteousness. May we demonstrate your love, your grace all of your attributes. Father, how I pray that if there's someone here this morning who's yet to place their faith in Jesus Christ and know the joy of of uncertainty of being on their way to heaven and knowing understanding too their purpose in life, I pray that today they would come face to face with that decision. That they would make a decision to place faith in Christ and thereby know that they're on their way to heaven. Work in our hearts and minds, Lord, I pray. And as children of the Most High, Father, may we take seriously the need to show forth your glory to this world. Pray all this now in Christ's precious name. Amen. Well, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as we have the opportunity to...